Welcome back to the channel everybody. In this video I'm going to be showing you this DIY S-Pod that I've been using for about a week in the truck and it's worked fine. I've not had any issues. This video is a little scripted just because there's a lot of information I didn't want you to hear a bunch of uhs and ums. So without further ado let's jump into it and check this thing out. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We all know the most important thing when you buy a new vehicle for camping, overlanding, off-roading, or more realistically to look cool in the mall parking lot is LEDs. Light bars, light pods, bumper lights, rock lights, ditch lights, whatever they may be, you need a way to control them all. So you go on Amazon and start searching for a control panel and you see a ton of options ranging from $20 to even $1,000. Realistically, they'll both accomplish the same goal. They'll turn whatever lights you have plugged into a circuit on it and off and on again to shine light on your driveway while you dream about being somewhere 2,000 miles away. Just me? Okay. In this video, I'm gonna show you why this project took me so long, why it's been over a month since my last upload, and how to do it yourself in just a few hours if you're handy. We're gonna do YouTube a little differently here. I'm gonna show you exactly how to replicate this yourself before I dive into every single little detail to stretch this video for more ad money. If you appreciate that, you should probably subscribe and like this video. My monkey brain likes seeing the numbers go up and I desperately need the dopamine hit. Let's begin. You could go with an eight individual rocker switch panel, which will work, but it's clunky, messy, and takes up a lot of space. Then you see an S-Pod, which is a much cleaner solution. It has a screen, you only have to run one wire into your cab, it has Bluetooth to control from your phone, and it'll net you a lot of attention from Jeep bros that know you have money and are willing to spend it. But what if you're not a Jeep bro? What if you are, but you're just trying to ball on a budget? What if you're a normal person like me with my Tacoma? Seeing the Oxbeam and other countless weird name rebrands of this kind of switch panel that you get on Alibaba for 50 to 60 bucks a piece if you happen to need 100 of them, you think to yourself, it's probably good enough for under 150 bucks. And it is. I've been using one of these for the past three years and I've had zero issues, but I'm a nerd who vastly underestimated this project and needs something to ruin my way of life. So I decided to build that S-Pod myself, thinking it's just a screen, it turns on eight circuits, how hard could it be? You will need several additional items. I'll link to everything in the description below that I used. This project cost in total with the tools around 70 bucks and six weeks of my life that I will never get back. You're going to need a microcontroller and a screen. If you're not familiar with microcontrollers, that's fine. Neither was I to start this project. Thankfully, the internet and chat GPT helped me along the way. I settled on this 4.3 inch touchscreen with an ESP32 on the back from a company called Waveshare. They also have a 7 inch screen version if you're interested or find that it works better for your needs. The ESP32 on the back runs at 3.3 volts which is important because the circuit control box here runs at 3.3 volts. I had this running initially with an Arduino Mega and logic level shifter that would translate 5 volts to 3.3 volts and vice versa, but this all in one unit is much much easier. First things first, I need to create a user interface. These microcontrollers don't have an operating system, so everything needs to be coded. This was an initial hiccup. I knew nothing about coding and now know even less. Something about the Dunning-Kruger effect. There is a program called Squareline Studio which creates a user interface that can be exported onto the Waveshare, so we're gonna dive into that a little bit later. You'll need to download the open source project files in the description below. I've uploaded the folder you need along with a partitions.csv file onto GitHub. Link to this will be in the description below. You'll need this later. There will be the interface files along with the actual coding files to make everything work. You'll also need to download a few more programs and drivers because this couldn't be easy. It had to be annoying. First, you'll need to download this program called Squareline Studios. This is the program we just talked about. It makes the UI and it's easier than trying to figure out how to code a button to be green and square-ish like mine. You also need to download this Waveshare LCD driver that someone else had to make because the Waveshare documentation isn't good enough and will leave you banging your head against a wall. I'll do a quick showing here, but I'll also link to this guy's YouTube video below for a more in-depth guide. He really helped me, so probably should give him a view or two. Take the driver and copy it over to the boards folder of Squareline, which is normally under your username directory. With this installed, it should now pop up in Squareline Studio. If you're comfortable with coding and figuring things out, you can change the UI yourself here before we proceed to the next step. Otherwise, just copy what I've already done and you should be good to go. Import the UI version 5 SPJ project file in and look at the bottom right and make sure your settings match mine. 
If everything lines up, click export in the top left and then create template project and just save this to your desktop. We'll use this later. Next, you'll download Espressif IDE to communicate with the WaveShare unit. Make sure you press the 5.3.1 version. That's what mine was built on and the newer version could give an error. This takes a few minutes to download and install, but the big thing here is to make sure that the ESP32-S3 box is checked. After it's installed, open the program and right click in the Project Explorer and click New Espressif IDF Project. Name the project UIV5 or whatever you want and put the project target as the ESP32 S3. With that created, you'll need to import the UI exported from Squareline Studios earlier. Make sure to select all so that it imports everything. With that imported, press build in the top left and you should get an error message after everything is built. Click the SDK config file from the project explorer on the left and let it load. This only loads after you build the project and get the error for some reason. Scroll all the way down to LVGL configuration at the bottom and uncheck enable the custom font along with Lottie library and then save. You should be able to rebuild it now without any errors. Now head over to GitHub and download the folder. This is a zip file so it will need to be extracted. Once it's extracted, you're going to want to copy over the main folder and the partitions.csv. These are going to be copied directly into the project's top level directory. Make sure you're pressing copy and overwrite all. With these entered in, press build in the top left and it should take about 20 to 30 seconds, but it will build. You may get a warning about partition size, but just ignore it. With that built, plug in your WaveShare unit and click the gear icon. Make sure the IDF target is ESP32-S3 along with the serial port of your unit. With that selected, now press run and let it work its magic. You should have buttons on a screen now. All that work for 10 buttons. Now to wire it up for communications to your circuit box. This is where things get tedious. The ESP32 doesn't have pinouts on this board, so you have to attach directly to the pads. You'll need to connect to the TX RX pads here. The controller cable from the circuit box has yellow and white. Yellow is TX, white is RX. I tried to use wires directly and it wouldn't hold no matter how much hot glue or solder paste I used. I ended up taking the metal off of a resistor and using solder paste. I didn't record this because I honestly had no hope it would hold or work, but it did. I then used these heat shrink solder connectors to connect the metal wires to my actual wires and use the connectors for the 3.3 volts input along with the ground. I didn't want to try to attach directly to the pads anymore because it honestly sucked. With these wires connected, I used some hot glue to attach them to the board to hopefully prevent any movement or pull out that would make me have to redo this. It does look like a mommy bloggers crafts project, but I'm okay with that. With this all connected, my next step was to hop into Fusion 360 and design a case so that I could protect and mount it. I went with a three piece design, but could probably combine the front and middle piece. I made the back with this hole so that it would be routed down, up, or out the back without having to redo the connector. A bunch of test prints and fits later due to ASA shrinking and me forgetting about tolerances, I finally have a working case. All I had to do was put some heat press nut certs in the front plate and back plate. I put these two larger ones on the back to attach a RAM ball mount that I also 3D printed. The whole thing is a little thicker than I'd like it to be, but it's good enough. And once again, I'm tired of this project. <laughs> With it all assembled, all that's left to do is install it in my truck and get that sweet, sweet street cred that absolutely nobody cares about but me. I haven't decided exactly where I want it yet. I know I'm probably going to move it from here, but I haven't decided if I'll go to the A pillar or somewhere else. That's future hobby's problem. And just to give you all a little overview of the UI real quick, we obviously have our eight buttons for each circuit, ditch lights, bumper lights, rock lights, whatever they may be. We have a battery voltage section up here in the top left, which is not created yet, except in the UI, but it's not functional. All on, all off. Then we have a setup tab where we can change each button's label. So aux six, we can just change it to left roof. 
and you'll notice that the screen shifts kind of so we have the buttons over here and here that's some coding issue i couldn't figure out so my solution that i got basically when you press save it resets the device and then everything comes back and hopefully the text is now scaled more correctly and centered this was the best i could get before i got this video out like i said we just wanted to make some progress and update everyone on what's going on because this has been six weeks at least six weeks of work it's a lot so what's next well these wave share units do have bluetooth and wi-fi so i'd like to see if i can get my phone to connect so i can control from anywhere within range since this unit is completely coded by me i like to see if i could add a voltage limit so that if the voltage drops below 12 it kills all circuits not to drain the battery I also would like to add a way to have the lights flash instead of just being toggled on and off. All of this should be possible. All I need to do is figure out the coding. Now, with that all out of the way, let's dive into the nerdy stuff a bit in case you wanted some info to do this yourself. These units are TTL 3.3 volt devices that are using serial communication using UART protocol with a baud rate of 115,200. These require a preceding byte and then the control byte, which is 0xAA, and then the control byte, such as 0x80 for button one, 0x40 button two, 20 for button three, and so on and so on. And we can see this in our UI events.c. So in Squareline Studios, we can have it send a function when we press button one, button two. So when we turn button one on, it sends 0x80, and then when we turn button one off, it clears that bit right here. And then in our main, we have this here of defining the global control byte of 0x00. Zero zero zero. And then further down, we have here the preceding byte so that everybody is on the same page, both the controller box and our controller. Additionally, we need to have our UART configuration coded in. So we have to have our definitions we have UART number two. I'm not sure if the number two actually matters. Then we have our TX and our RX pin specified, 43 for TX, 44 for RX, along with our UART configuration. So we have our baud rate of 115, 200. This is some more coding regarding UART. Now I am not an expert, but I just wanted to show this so people who do know they know more about this than me. But we just have our receive and send data here as well for the coding. And lastly, I wanted to point out this load labels from NVS. This is where the NVS flash storage of the ESP32 is loading the labels of the buttons after every restart. So it's saving when we press that save button on screen two. And then upon the UI refreshing, and the unit restarting, it's going to load those labels per button so that everything remains as we want it. This is our test bench setup, but it's going to be uh, the same in your vehicle. You have 12 volts coming into the positive, your ground connected to the ground of your car, to the chassis, your circuits out. So I have a light here, a light here. This is one, this is eight. This is our um, positive, negative transmission and receiving wire that goes to our screen here. So why isn't our screen on when we have 12 volts coming in? And that's because we have a separate thing here. This is power to our controller. So this takes 12 volts and a ground here. And all it is is sending three volts out of here into our connector. So to do this for our test setup, we're just gonna jump it. Make sure we get a good connection on there. and we're booted up. And we can turn all of our lights on just like that. And then with the test fit working, everything plugged in, off, on, everything works. It was time to stall it back into the truck. I have it mounted on my fuse box and I have this absolute rat's nest of a wiring job. So I just plugged a couple in just for testing. I desperately, desperately need to redo all this wiring and that's my plan. This is basically a combination of adding different things as I've owned the truck over five years instead of doing it all at once. And that's gonna wrap up this video. It took so much longer than I thought. Um, this is about the third time I've shot this video. Each time towards the end of the edit, I just wasn't content with how it came out. So I think we've finally nailed it on this one. 
I actually had a trip planned to make a vlog of testing out the trailer um, and doing some disc golf trips into the mountains uh, right before Thanksgiving, but I did this to my ankle um, the Saturday before Thanksgiving. That first picture is free if you want more, you have to pay. But I'm still recovering from that, so I'm not able to really walk yet. It's been three weeks. I'm still hobbling around, so that put a damper on pretty much every plan and every project I've had going on. So uh, I'm still recovering from that, but I hope you all had a good Thanksgiving, and it's pretty much Christmas already, so hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and I'll catch you in the next video. Peace out.